This is Twit. The Bluetooth Low Energy Advertisement payload shall contain a resolvable and private address for the accessory, which is the 6-byte Bluetooth LE MAC address. The address must be private and it must rotate periodically and be unlinkable. Otherwise, if the same address is used for long periods of time, an adversary may be able to track a legitimate person who is carrying the accessory. A rotation policy aims to reduce this risk. A general approach to generate to generate addresses meeting this requirement is to construct them using a pseudo-random function, taking as input a secret key established during the pairing of the accessory and either a counter or a coarse notion of time. The counter or cor coarse notion of time allows for the address to change periodically. The secret key allows the owner devices to predict the sequence of addresses for the purpose of recognizing its paired accessories. An accessory shall rotate its resolvable and private address on any transition from near owner state to separated state, as well as any transition from separated state to near owner state. So like as soon as it realizes it's no longer with its owner, bang, immediately the MAC address changes. And similarly, as soon as it gets, it, it is back within the region of, of, of its owner, the MAC address changes again. But it also changes autonomously. When in near owner state, the accessory shall rotate its resolvable and private address every 15 minutes. This is a privacy consideration to deter tracking of the accessory by non-owners when, when it is in physical proximity to the owner. Since it is nearby, the owner device is able to maintain synchronization so that it's able to recognize and remain paired with its known accessories. When in a separated state, the accessory shall rotate its resolvable and private address every 24 hours. This duration allows a platform's unwanted tracking algorithms to detect that the same accessory is in proximity with it for some period of time when the owner is not in the tags or accessories physical proximity. So this seems well thought out. Devices rotate their 8-byte MAC address on a schedule as directed by a secret key. This is exactly analogous to the TOTP one-time passwords where you all, where many of us are using today, um, though with six 8-bit bytes rather than only six digits. By knowing each device's secret key, all future MAC addresses can be determined and no one tracking a device based on its periodic broadcasts will be able to determine any tag's next MAC address. It's worth noting that the devices have no actual native MAC addresses. Unlike the anti-tracking technology we've developed for smartphone Wi-Fi, there is not one rotating spoofed MAC address used when roaming and another actual physical fixed MAC address used when associated or paired with a Wi-Fi, you know, home base or, or access point. So these tags are all simply using the traditional 8-byte, 48-bit MAC as a short-term rotating ID. And there's a galaxy of them, you know, 100 million of them out there now and growing all occasionally changing their identifier following a predictable pattern that only their owner knows. Another intriguing aspect of this specification is that non-owned devices are required to do, uh, I'm sorry, of the specification is what non-owned devices, that is, that is the, the tags that are in their separated state, are required to do to reveal themselves. The spec calls this non-owner finding, and it has a number of components. The spec says, once a user has been notified of an unknown accessory traveling with them, it is required 
that they have the means to physically locate the accessory. This is called non-owner finding of the accessory. These capabilities are both required and recommended and reflect hardware to be incorporated into the accessory to enable non-owner finding. Now we'll explain it. Motion detection. The accessory should include a motion detector that can detect accessory motion reliably, for example, an accelerometer. If the accessory includes an accelerometer, it must, all caps, be configured to detect a change in orientation of plus or minus 10 degrees along any two axes of the accessory. After some number of hours, between 8 and 24, chosen randomly from a uniform distribution, so that would be an average of 16 hours, so no fewer than 8, no more than 24, but an average of 16, the accessory being away from its owner and in a separated state, the accessory's motion detector will be enabled. While the motion detector is enabled, it must be able to detect motion within 10 seconds. Okay, so it's sampling its position at 10 second intervals, presumably to conserve power. The spec says if motion is not detected within the 10 second period, the accessory must stay in this state until it exits separated state. Okay, so, so accessory leaves the owner. S after some time between 8 and 24 hours from then, the motion detector is activated. And at 10 second intervals, it starts sampling its angular position in space. The spec says if motion is detected within the 10, second, 10 seconds between samples, the accessory must play a sound. After any motion is detected, the movement detection period is decreased from 10 seconds to half a second. Okay, so it starts sampling much more quickly after first detecting any motion. The accessory must continue to play a sound for every detected motion. The accessory shall disable the motion detector for six hours under either of the following two conditions. Motion has been detected for 20 seconds at the half a second sampling rate or 10 sounds have been played. Okay, so, so after this thing has become motion sensitive, which uh, after an average of 16 hours of being away from its owner, then any motion of more than 10 degrees on two axes will cause it to make a sound and will also cause it to shorten its sampling to, to half a second and to continue making sounds if it continues being moved until either 20 seconds have passed or 10 sounds have been played. After that point, it then goes into a six hour, they call it a back off. So, it, you know, goes to sleep for six hours. It says, the, the spec says, if the accessory is still in its separated state at the end of the six hour back off, which has, you know, it's gone silent, essentially, it's not going to just keep beeping or screaming, whatever it's going to be doing, the unwanted tracking behavior must restart. So again, after six hours of quiet time, if it is again moved, it starts making sounds. Any Bluetooth LE connection from a paired device must reset the separated behavior and transition the accessory to, con to connected state. In other words, the instant it's back with its owner, then it's paired and it, put, and it shuts this down and it goes back into, uh, uh, you know, near owner state. And finally, they said the accessory must include a sound maker, for example, a speaker of some kind, to play sound when in separated state, either periodically or when motion is detected. It must also play sound when a non-owner tries to locate the accessory by initiating a play sound command from a non-owner device when the accessory is in range and connectable through Bluetooth LE. The sound must be loud, and the sound must be played for a minimum of five seconds each time. 
And in the spec, it goes into a, a detailed specification of the measuring of loudness that the devices are able to have. Okay, so this gives us a system where after a tracking device has been separated from its owner for an unknown interval of time, randomly chosen between 8 and 24 hours, its motion detector activates. At that point, it begins taking readings of its angular orientation in three space every 10 seconds, and if it finds that it's been rotated by more than 10 degrees through any two axes between successive position samples, it will emit a clearly audible sound for five seconds. And if any qualifying movement is detected within those 10 second intervals, it will have, you know, essentially that will have roused it so that it will start sampling twice per second to allow it to make its noise much more responsively to someone who may be attempting to discover its location by, you know, moving things around. All of this occurs whenever a tag is separated from its owner for between 8 and 24 hours. It's about requiring anything that is small that can track to deliberately reveal itself periodically. And in doing so, using simple sound, which does not require any technology where the tag is located. Note that a lot of attention has been given to detecting unwanted tracking tags with another smartphone. But not everyone has a phone that's smart enough to do so today. Today, unless that AirTag Apple app is launched and running on an Android phone, no Android carrying user would be able to detect an unwanted nearby tag. This spec will be changing that soon for new Android devices. But we know that there will remain many non-upgraded Android devices in use for years, and there are also non-smart cellular phones. I was recently listening to a talking head on some show suggesting that one way to keep young people away from the perils of social media would be to equip them with only a dumb phone capable of making and receiving telephone calls, texting, and taking pictures with its camera. Now, I don't know whether this person has ever actually been around any young kids, but that would be a tough sell when they're surrounded by their peers who are gleefully deep into the social internet. So... Good luck with that. But still, the point being, not everybody is carrying a cell phone. So there's clearly a need to expose trackers through some low-tech means, and sound is the obvious choice. This is not what someone wishing to track someone stealthily would choose, right? Because the device is going to give itself away. After that initial period of 8 to 24 hours of separation from all of, it, of its owner's devices, any tag that remains separated will generate attention-getting sounds whenever it's significantly moved. And once it has done so 10 times or for 20 seconds of movement in its faster sampling mode, it will go quiet for six hours, after which it will again reawaken and notify of any movement. The obvious weakness in this system is that tracking requires radio, but not sound. So arranging to enclose a tag inside some sort of acoustic suppression container, which is transparent to radio, might defeat the tag's audible, you know, help me, I become separated from my owner, cries for help. In addition to physical movement, which will trigger sounding, any nearby device within radio, you know, Bluetooth LE radio range of a tag whether a tag's owner or non-owner is able to remotely command any tag to emit its sound. So if, for example, a suspected tracker is detected, the detecting smartphone's user interface for managing tags can request any unseen tags to sound off to aid in determining you know, their location. Tags also contain a wealth of queryable information. This includes a unique 8-byte uh, token, a UUID, that serves as a unique identifier for the accessory make and model. The 8-byte value will be listed in a public registry so that the tag's issuing company can be determined. 
The tags also contain the manufacturer's name in, a, in an up to 64-byte field, so plenty of length. And also another 64 bytes for the model's name, so that can be made clear. There's also an 8-byte accessory category indicator. Only the first single byte of the 8 bytes is presently defined, though 8 have been set aside. And many of the values of that byte are already defined. To give you a, a sense for how the publishers expect these tags are going to be used, those the the the, the enumerations of the eight of the one byte that's been defined are things like a generic finder. Then there's also uh, other, also luggage, backpack, jacket, coat, shoes, bike, scooter, stroller, wheelchair, boat, helmet, skateboard, skis, snowboard, surfboard, camera, laptop, watch, flash drive, drone, headphones, earphones, inhaler, sunglasses, handbag, wallet, umbrella, water bottle, tools or toolbox, keys, smart case, remote, hat, motorbike, consumer electronic vehicle, apparel, transportation device, sports equipment, and personal items. Well done. You just passed our cognitive test. You, <laughs> you do not have dementia, Steve. Congratulations. <laughs> and had I been able to do that from memory, Leo, <laughs> I, would be, I would agree with you. So anyway, that gives us some sense for, the, for what the people behind this are thinking about the future and about the wide potential for this location tracking technology. Um, I suspect that there's every chance that, as I said, that many higher end consumer products like that e-bike, you know, which are prone to misplacement, loss or theft, or which might need to be located with some urgency, such as an inhaler may eventually incorporate this consumer location technology as a sales feature. The last item of the queryable data is a four byte 32 bit value, which enumerates a tag's capabilities. Only four bits are currently defined. Those are supports sound, supports motion detection, supports serial number lookup by near field, and supports serial number lookup by Bluetooth. There's also some interesting specification about deliberate disablement. The spec says the accessory shall have a way to be disabled such that its future locations cannot be seen by its owner. Disablement shall be done via some physical action. For example, a button press, a gesture, or the removal of the battery. The accessory manufacturer shall provide both a text description of how to disable the accessory as well as a visual depiction, for example, image diagram, animation, etc., that must, in all caps, be available when the platform, you know, the thing that the, you know, the smartphone is online and optionally when offline. Disablement procedure or instructions can change with accessory firmware updates. A registry which maps product data to an affiliated URL supporting retrieval of disablement instructions shall be available for platforms for reference. You know, again, remember the platforms in this spec refers to smartphones, pads, and similar devices with full user interfaces. And they said this URL must return a response which can be rendered by an HTML view. So this says that if someone discovers an unwanted tracking device, that 8-byte registered product ID data, which can always be retrieved directly by querying the device over Bluetooth, will, among other things, point to a URL which returns HTML that any smartphone can render to obtain clear and updated instructions from the device's manufacturer about how to manually disable the tracker. And this is all in, you know, capital musts. But this always requires physical access to the device. At least at this point in the evolution of the specification, it cannot be done remotely over radio. 
it's foreseeable that this might be allowed over NFC since that requires essentially physical proximity and it might be simpler. As we'll see, the spec does make clear some distinctions about what can be done via NFC and what can only be done over Bluetooth, uh, or rather Bluetooth and only under NFC. This episode of Tech Break is brought to you by ACI Learning. Certifications show more than proving a skill set. They let everyone see you are committed to keeping your knowledge and skills up to date. The products you've grown to love, IT Pro, Audit Pro, and Practice Labs, are now training the modern workforce together. Be bold. Train smart. Check out go.acilearning.com slash twit to learn more. 